Lord, we're here just seeking you. We want to worship you, Lord. We thank you for this time, just this awesome weekend where you died for us, Lord, and took our sin on the cross and just give us freedom from sin. We love you, Lord. This morning we acknowledge that you are the risen king, and we give you glory for that. Lord, we ask that your spirit fill this place and in all the different houses of the people who are watching this, and that to your name would be all glory, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living
All right. Well, welcome. It's Easter, and uh, we just want to welcome you. Thanks for tuning in with us wherever you're at right now. Uh, it's, it's still a shutdown, lockdown for everybody, but uh, we're still going forward for Jesus. And what a beautiful thing to have us all in our homes right now and nothing stopping us from worshiping the Lord. You know, uh, one of my friends had texted me this week, and he said this was the first Easter, or should I say the first Passover, where all of God's people had to be locked down in their homes since Exodus chapter 12. And I thought, wow, what an observation. That is so cool in a sense, because I thought it wasn't long after the first Passover in Egypt that they were removed from Egypt, and, and Egypt is the type of the world. And I thought, how cool would that be if God was going to remove us from the world? real soon. And so I'm looking forward to his coming. I know you are. Um, been excited to see our, our president's been praying in his, in his cabinet. And, and wow, how cool is that? It, naming the name of Jesus Christ and reading from the book of Isaiah. And I, I, last week, uh, about a week and a half ago, my wife and I were watching the news and we heard the president say how grieved he was that this was the first time in his lifetime that uh, Christians wouldn't be able to celebrate uh, uh, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter in the actual church, but that they were confined to their homes. And then he shared that he was going to be tuning in live streaming with Pastor Greg Laurie, Harvest Crusade, Harvest Ministries there in Riverside. And my wife and I were like, yes, I, you know, how cool is that to have a president that, that's listening to to a sound biblical teacher of the Word of God. And, and then I hear these reports that they're, they're having prayer meetings every morning in the White House before he, has, before he goes out to do his duties. That is so cool. And a number of people are involved in those prayer meetings, pastors from all over the nation, as they gather together in the morning digitally and they pray together. Guys like uh, Franklin Graham and Will Graham have been praying with the president. You guys remember uh, them when they were out here a couple years ago helping with the disaster, and then we did the Franklin Wilgram celebration, and many of you were involved with that, helping with that, and then Greg Laurie has been part of that prayer thing, and he was just here like, oh, five, six weeks ago, right before the shutdown, sharing with us, and, and guys like Jack Hibbs, who was here back in August, and sharing with the church, and these guys are all praying for for the president and with him. And I thought, how cool is that? Because, you know, we've had those guys here sharing with us and it somehow makes us all feel connected. Like we're, we're there too, because we know these guys, we know they're sound teachers. We know they stick to the Bible and we know they're going to encourage the president in the right way that he should go. And so that makes us all feel kind of connected. But you know, what's better than that is being connected to Jesus Christ the real famous one, to, to just have Jesus and know that we can have access to him at any time, the creator of all things. He's torn the veil, and we can go boldly before the throne of grace at any time and be with him. That is what's most important, and that's the most exciting thing, the famous one, Jesus Christ. Today, what I'm going to do is uh, something a little bit different than uh, what you're used to. You're used to just the resurrection story, and uh, i got to be truthful with you. I wasn't even supposed to be here right now. I was supposed to be in the Philippines, breaking ground, building a church. Uh, but because they're locked down and we're locked down, we're here today. And uh, Pastor Jason was supposed to be uh, doing the message today. But since I'm stuck here at home, we thought we would both do the message. And so I won't, because I'm not in the Philippines, we, we love those guys. We're praying for them. Pastor Lito in Manila, Calvary Chapel, and Pastor Anton up there in Solano and, and Calvary Chapel, Solano, Villa Verde. They're awesome guys. We love you guys. And I know you're probably tuning in, and we're just praying for you. And so what what we're going to do today is something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to be in, in Luke chapter 19, and what I'm going to do is bring you from the triumphal entry to the cross, and then I'm going to have Pastor Jason come up and share the glorious resurrection with you. So I thought it would be good for us to get that running start of that last week of Jesus's ministry uh, when he rode in, leading up to the cross, and then the good news that the tomb is empty. And so we're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 28. Let's read it. And when he had spoken, speaking of the Lord... He went before and ascended to Jerusalem, and it came to pass he was come nigh to Bethage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives. 
He sent two of his disciples saying, go you into the village over against you and in the which that you will enter in, you shall find a colt, a small donkey tied whereon yet no man has ever sat. Loose him and bring him here. And if a man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they, they that went, they, sent, they were sent, and they went their way, and they found it even as the Lord had said. And as they were loosening the colt, the owners therefore said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come near, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for their word. And we just ask that you would just make this uh, this familiar passage just new in our hearts, Lord, that we would grab onto what you've done for us. Bless this time. Speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What a scene. What a scene. Jesus riding over. He sends his disciples to get a a small donkey. We know that that small donkey was near its mom. They loosened him, brought him to Jesus. And and this is a little donkey that's never been ridden. And you you got to understand, you just don't jump up on a donkey that's never been ridden. And Jesus comes riding in on this donkey, and they're laying down their garments. They're laying down their palms, and and it's just an amazing scene as they're worshiping the Lord, and they're saying, blessed be the name. Behold, the king cometh. I mean, it's just, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now. What a scene. But the Pharisees are upset. They don't like that. They're, 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 they're asking Jesus to tell his disciples to be quiet. They're probably looking on Jesus right now in this situation, and they're kind of going, look at him. Look, he's acting like he's a king, and look, he's coming in on a baby donkey. Are you kidding me? Real kings come in on a stallion, on a white horse, and real generals ride in on a stallion. And, and, and you know what? Jesus was coming meek and lowly, but one day he's going to come back. He's going to come back, the second coming, and he will be riding white horse, and he will be a conquering king. He comes lowly and meek as a servant to die for our sins now, but he's coming back as a conquering king. He didn't come in on a stallion. He came on this donkey. He, you know, you look at some of the leaders of today as they're going around the world and meeting in certain places. You see their whole motor entourage. It's like, you know, it's limos. It's stretched limos. It's Lincolns. It's Mercedes. It's, it's Humvees. It's the best UC, uh, SUV possible. You know, and, and, and here's Jesus riding in, not on a Cadillac, but like a Prius. <laughs> you know, he's coming in on this donkey, lowly. And meek. And you know what? You just don't sit on a donkey. You don't sit on a horse or a donkey that's never been ridden because you're going to be thrown off real quick. But see, here's what's cool. This donkey knew his creator. And what a slap in the face that was to the Pharisees because to the Pharisees, the Pharisees, they, 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 they looked at him riding this donkey, and a donkey is a picture of, of being stubborn. And, and this donkey was a slap into the face to the Pharisees because at least the donkey recognized the Messiah, and they didn't. When Jesus rode in, he, it says in verse 41 that when he came near the city, he began to weep. Why was he weeping? He wept because um, the nation as a whole had rejected him. Oh, sure, all his disciples were around there, but the nation as a whole had rejected him, and so he wept. He wept. Why? Because it says that if they would have known this thy day, they would have received him as king. What does he mean, this thy day? Back in Daniel chapter 9, it was prophesied by Daniel to the day that the Lord Jesus would show up, that the Messiah would show up. Daniel predicted 173,880 days, and he was on target to the day. 
to when Jesus rode in. And Jesus wept because he knew the nation wasn't going to receive him. But here we see this scene where all these disciples are gathered around and they're worshiping. And they had seen the many great things he's done. They're screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna. And, and then we know three days later they're going to be yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Is this the same crowd? I hope not. It says this was a crowd of his disciples here. And, and I think of all the multitudes that he touched lives through, that he reached out to. And you think of the, the, the feeding of the 5,000. And then there was another feeding of a great multitude. And, but the feeding of the 5,000, was, it was recorded as 5,000 men. We don't know how many women and children were there. So it could have been up to anywhere from fifteen to 20,000 people getting fed. Then there was another feeding of the multitude. Then there was the people that he reached out to preaching the good news and giving the word of God. There were those that he healed, those that he healed from being crippled. He gave the blind sight, the deaf could hear, and, and the miracles he did, cleansing the lepers and casting out demons, all kinds of things, raising the dead. And they were gathered around screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna. But his heart was broke because they didn't know this thy day. And the religious leaders and rulers and the nation as a whole rejected him. We know that after that day, he kept coming up into the temple uh, day after day teaching. The next day he came in, flipped some tables in the Gentile court area because they were, they were selling stuff and ripping the people off. It was a time of uh, the Passover feast, a mandatory feast where Jerusalem would swell from 600,000 population to anywhere from two and a half to three million of a population. And they were ripping the people off, selling them animals and money exchanging. And he comes in there and he flips tables and he says he says in one gospel he says you've made my father's house a den of thieves and in Luke he says you've made my house a den of thieves and then he came back for a couple days and was teaching in the temple area. And then we come to this beautiful picture of the Lord's Supper where we, we see him with his disciples. That We call it the Last Supper. And Judas goes out to betray him. And, and Jesus breaks bread and he says, this is, this, is, this is my body which is broken for you. And then he takes the cup and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant, the new testament. This is my blood that's shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And they drink of the cup. And then he says this, I will no more drink from the, this vine until I drink it with you anew in my father's kingdom. And they knew exactly what he was talking about. This was such a thing that the Galilean wedding would speak of as a bridegroom would, would uh, have his bride before him, the betrothal, and they would agree to these terms, this covenant. And then the bridegroom would give a cup of joy, a cup of wine to the bride, and she would drink from it saying, I agree to what you're offering me. And then he would drink, and then he would say, I will not drink of this cup until I drink it with you in my father's house. What a beautiful picture. His disciples knew what he was saying. And then the bridegroom would go to prepare a place. And Jesus says, in my father's house is many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if it was not so, I would say so. But I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come again. And I will bring you unto myself. That where I am, you will be also. They knew he was speaking of a wedding. They knew the excitement there. And all they wanted to know was when he was coming back. And he said, no man knows the hour. Not the angels in heaven. Not the sun but only the Father. And in the Galilean wedding, it was only the Father that knew when the actual wedding day would take place. And so they realized he was coming back. And then we see, as they finish the Last Supper, they come over the brook Kidron, singing songs up into the Garden of Gethsemane. And he starts to pray. And you know, this is where he started sweating great drops of blood as he prayed, Lord, Father, if, any, if this cup could pass, if there was any other way, but not my will, your will be done. What he was saying was that if there's any other way by which man could be saved... Let's do it, but not my will, but thy will. And this is something that we all need to be praying. When we ask for things, when we pray, let's finish up our prayers with, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. You can ask for things, that's great, but you want to invite Jesus to come in and say, Lord, I know I got plans, but you mess up all my plans. I want to do your will. I want your will to be done. 
And so Jesus knew that he had to come to the cross. And as he's up there praying, the disciples are asleep. We see this group, this entourage, this hundreds of people from temple security, the guards, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and all these elders coming with swords and staff and torches because it's in the middle of the night. And they're winding themselves up to the, the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and to me, I just picture it because it's at night with all these torches like a fiery serpent slipping slithering up the hill, ready to bite our Lord. And you remember when they got before Jesus and Judas betrayed him with a kiss that Jesus says, who are you looking for? And they say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am. And they all fell down. He just knocked him over with his word. And then they got back up and they were probably a little sheepish. And he says, who do you seek? And they were probably like, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> and he said, I am. And they took him. And they took him, and that night, they held an illegal court session. No court, no, no, no session was ever to be held at night. They weren't in the proper building. Everything about this court hearing was, was illegal. It was wrong. They didn't even have the witnesses that could agree on anything. It was a sham. They were railroading Jesus. They just wanted him dead, and then they delivered him to Caiaphas. Caiaphas said, I don't see any fault in this guy. He washed his hands from it. And then he asked them if they wanted him to release Jesus. And they said, release Barabbas instead. And they said, crucify Jesus. And the Pharisees whipped up the crowd and they said, crucify him, crucify him. And you know the story. He was beaten. He was whipped beyond recognition. You know, and if you saw the passion of the Christ and how brutal that was, uh, the one thing we do know is that we could still identify the actor that was playing Jesus in that movie. The Bible says that you couldn't identify Jesus. He was so badly beaten. They ripped out his beard. They punched him in the face. They put a sack over his head and hit him and said, prophesy who's hitting you. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They whipped him and opened up his back, his flesh, his muscles, his organ area. They just, they just beat him to a pulp to where you couldn't even recognize him. And then they nailed him to a cross. And as they nailed him to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they stood him up. And there was a thief on each side. And people walked by, and they wagged their finger, and they mocked him, and they railed on him. And even the thieves were mocking and railing on him until one thief all of a sudden got clarity. And he said... He rebuked the other thief, and he said, you know, we deserve what we got coming to us, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he looked at the Lord, and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. And Jesus hanging on the cross, dying, a wild moment. Psalms 22 gives us an account of the, the crucifixion and nails it down to the T, the prophecy in Psalm 22. If you read it, you'll notice that there was, there was demonic beings that were circling the cross as he was hanging there. Satan and his cronies, they thought they'd done it. They thought they'd stop the Messiah. There was darkness that came over the whole place for three hours from 12 until 3 in the afternoon. And, and it says the bulls of Bashan were circling. Their mouths were gaping like lions and their wolves like dogs cruising around. And they were just kind of like probably circling just like we did it we did it we know satan had to be present there and then jesus cries out my god my god why has thou forsaken me first time in the bible that jesus ever called the father my god and the reason being was is that the father had to turn his back on the son because of sin the father had to turn his back on sin. And Jesus, for the first time in all of eternity, felt the separation from the father. He'd never felt that. He that knew no sin became sin for you and me. And he took the sin of the world, past, present, and future upon him. And he felt that separation. And he did that because he loves you. And then he said, it was finished. To tell us that. Paid in full. It was done. I love that. He said it was finished. I, I'm glad he wasn't hanging on the cross and he said, Good luck. I'm glad he said it was finished. And then he looked to heaven. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. 
notice that he's back to saying the father, the deed has been paid for, paid in full. He paid for our sin. And now he says, Father, I commend myself to you. And the earth quaked and the veil was torn. And I think right there, all those demonic spirits went, oops. And people realized he was who he really was. And now what do we want to look at is the resurrection. And so we're going to have Pastor Jason come up and share the glorious resurrection with you right now. Blessing to just relive the story. And I want to actually talk about the resurrection, maybe from a a, a place uh, that is a little bit different, um, but it'll obviously tie in. I actually want to read a passage as we consider the resurrection from uh, not a typical resurrection passage. It's actually John chapter 2. And it may seem confusing at first, but you'll see what I mean. This is John 2, verse uh, 13. It says, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Don't make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of the house of my house, or excuse me, your house, will consume me. This is the part I wanted to get to, verse 18. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for you doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the the Jews then said, "It it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scriptures, that the, word of, uh, the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. It's an amazing text. You know, um, I just want to start by maybe saying this. It's all true. What's all true? All of it. All of it. All of what Jesus said all of what Jesus claimed, all of what Jesus accomplished, all that Jesus was, it's all true. His death, burial, resurrection, and all the implications that follow that. And the reason I'm saying that is because actually this passage that I read to you um, was actually the cleansing of the temple. But you might say, now, wait a minute, didn't Pastor Steve just refer to the cleansing of the temple? Yes, this particular passage actually happened three years earlier. See, Jesus cleansed the temple twice. He cleansed it at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry. But why I pointed out this one this morning is because it's fascinating. He's overthrowing the money changers. He's bringing all this confusion and overthrowing everything and saying, don't turn my father's house into a house of, or a den of robbers. And he goes on. But when the Jews pressed him and said, what sign do you show us? In other words, they were saying, who do you think you are? What authority do you have? And Jesus gave them one sign. The sign was, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days or I will raise it up in three days. They thought he was talking about the the Herod's temple that had been in a remodel project for 46 years. But the commentary says that, that Jesus was what? Referring to the temple of his body. What that means is this. Jesus pinned all of his authority, all of his teachings, all of what he claimed to be, his whole ministry, his whole life, everything on one sign, and that would be the resurrection bodily, his bodily resurrection from the dead. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then nothing he said was valid, nothing he claimed was valid. It was all to be thrown out, but the reality is Jesus did raise from the dead. And so it's all true. Everything he claimed, everything he did, it's all true. Now, the, what I just want to point out quickly is this. I love at the end of that passage where it says, when therefore he was risen, it says the disciples remembered that he had said these things and they believed. And it made me think actually of the Luke passage that Pastor Steve was in. When Jesus raised from the dead and the disciples go to the tomb and they see an angel in the tomb, and, the, and I'm paraphrasing, but the angel says, Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. What did he say? Remember? He told you. And it says, they remembered. And I just love that. Back to the John 2 passage where it says, they remembered and they believed. 
they remembered that Jesus said this, not during that whole three years of the ministry with him, but it was after the cross and after the resurrection, the light went on and they went, he told us that this would happen. They remembered and they believed. That's the disciples. But for me, if you're like me, see, here's the thing. I've been a Christian for a long time. I believe in the resurrection. I believe in the cross. I believe all these things of who Jesus is. My issue is that I don't believe. My issue is I don't remember. Or I remember that it actually happened, but I forget the importance of it. And that's what I want to encourage us with this morning. The disciples remembered and believed. We oftentimes believe, but we forget. And I just want to remind us of three things this morning about the resurrection, the importance of the resurrection. By no means is this like an exhaustive teaching on the implications of the resurrection, but three things I want us to really remember. And, and please understand, when I say remember, again, I'm not talking about just, oh yeah, I remember that happened, or I remember I read that in the Bible. What I'm talking about is this, is, is, is reading the scriptures, hearing it again, and it becoming alive again to us. Why is it that something as important as the cross and as important as the resurrection can just slip out of the forefront of our minds and, and not, you know, dictate the way that we live? And I just want to remind us of a couple of things. I want you and I to think through a couple of things in regards to Jesus' resurrection. This is what we believe, but do we remember it? Number one, because Jesus raised from the dead, I want us to remember that our sins are forgiven. Because Jesus raised from the dead, our sins are forgiven. We could take all day on this, but I'll just point out what it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, that Jesus was lifted up for our transgressions, but he was raised up uh, for our justification. In other words, the resurrection validates the crucifixion. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, how would we know that he was actually paying for our sins on the cross? He would just be one of thousands thousands of, of, of people that were crucified on Roman crosses. But Jesus said, you're going to crucify me, but here's, here's going to be the sign. I'm going to bodily raise from the dead. And because he did that, we know that our sins were actually paid for, that the Father received that as adequate payment, if you would, and that it was good. It was real. That means all of our sins are actually forgiven. They really are. We are free from all of our sin. I, I think about what it says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul's making this amazing argument about the doctrine of the resurrection. And he says, you know, if you're saying that people don't raise from the dead, that means Christ didn't raise from the dead. And then he says, and if Christ didn't raise from the dead, you're still in your sin. And then it goes down to verse 20 and it says, but in fact, Christ did raise from the dead. So listen to me. In fact, Jesus did raise from the dead. So that means he really did pay for your sins. That means if you've put your faith in Christ, you really are forgiven because Jesus paid your penalty. You're forgiven and I'm forgiven. Amen. I know you believe that, but I want you to remember that in a way that's real this morning. Secondly, because Jesus raised from the dead, we have resurrection life right now. Again, we could take all day talking about this, but I'll just remind you of Romans 6, where Paul's talking about how we've identified with Jesus in his death, but it also means we've identified with Jesus in his resurrection life. And it says that we can now walk, listen, in the newness of life. When does eternal life begin? Not when you die. Eternal life begins the moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit of God takes up residence in you and you have resurrection life now. Paul said, I wanna know him and the power of his resurrection. You and I are identified, if you're a believer in Christ, with him in his life. I, I, another way of thinking about it is this. His life, his life is in you. He wants to live his life through your body. And evidence that you are born again is, man, you've changed from the inside out. You've get, you have that resurrection life now. You've got his joy. You've got his love. The Romans 6 talks about how we've got power over sin now. It doesn't mean we can't sin, but it means we're not under the dominion of the power of sin anymore. Jesus broke that on the cross, and we have resurrection life right now. We are living um, with eternal life right now. Jesus' life through us. And there's so many more implications about that, but that's a victorious and amazing and wonderful thing. 
We're not trying to gain salvation. We're not trying to like hold out someday and then I can have eternal life. Listen, if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, his spirit lives in you. You have resurrection life right now and you can just live with Christ living through you like Paul said. Well, again, we could explore that more and more. This is just more of a a, a little bit of a reminder. The last thing is this. Let me review. First of all, Jesus said, or it says, because Jesus is risen from the dead, our sins are forgiven. We have resurrection life now. But listen, because Jesus is risen, someday you and I will raise from the dead too. This is our hope, you guys. We will raise from the dead as well. Jesus said in John chapter uh, five, somewhere around verse 29, I actually read it in my devotions this morning, that at the end, we will be raised up in resurrection, some to life, and some to judgment. We are eternal beings, and every single human being will be bodily resurrected. And those who have put their faith in Christ will have their resurrection body in the presence of God, and it will be glorious forever and ever. Amen. Those who have not put their faith in God, they will still be resurrected, but they'll be resurrected to face a judgment, a judgment where they'll be cast out of his presence for all of eternity. But for us, listen, this is our hope. We are going to rise again. Paul, again, referring back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul said, if our hope in Jesus is only in this life, we of all people are to be the most pitied. If if we're just holding on to some fake idea or false idea about Jesus and is only kind of good for this 80 years, 90, 100 years that we're on this earth, we're pitiful. We've, We've put our hope in something that won't last forever. But listen, our hope is not just in this life, our hope is that we are going to live on forever and ever and ever and ever. That is true. Listen, every single human being at some point will wrestle with the fact, why am I here? What's gonna happen when I die? And it's only those of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ who have the peace of God and we know that sooner or later, God forbid it would be a coronavirus or some other cancer or thing that ends your life. The point is, Our lives will end someday. But for us as believers, we are going to rise again to be with him forever and ever. Now, just a little point of clarification. I don't want you to think that we have to wait someday, then we'll rise again. Listen, the moment you die, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But we are gonna have a body that is physically resurrected and transformed. We're gonna be with him forever. My point is we have hope. You have hope if you're a believer in Christ. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, all of what we're doing, all this church stuff is a complete and total waste of time. We're kidding ourselves. But if Jesus did raise from the dead, it means it's all true. It means our sins are forgiven. It means we can have resurrection life now. It means that someday we're gonna go to heaven and we're gonna be with him forever. But see, this is my last thought. See, I'm talking to Christians talking to those who've been born again. I'm talking to those who have cried out for God's mercy and realized we can't save ourselves and we need a savior and we've simply received that free gift of salvation. But if you're here, that's force of habit. If you're here, I'm talking in the auditorium. If you're listening online or you're listening in your living room or wherever you're hearing this and you're not a born again believer in Jesus, if you haven't believed in him or put your trust in him, These things are not true of you. It means your sins are not yet forgiven. It means you don't have resurrection life now, and it means you don't have hope in the future, but you can. You see, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible goes on to say that um, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. And, And if you will put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, that he died, that he was buried, that he was risen, and you personally cry out to him and ask him to be your Lord and Savior, you can know that your sins are forgiven, you can experience resurrection life now, and you can have the hope of heaven later. So let me read to you one last passage. This is from John, excuse me, not John, Romans chapter 10. It says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. If you don't know today, if you're not sure, and you want to put your faith in Jesus Christ, I'd like to lead you in a prayer. 
I can lead you in that prayer, but you have to pray from your heart. This is between you and God, and I'm going to give you the opportunity to do what it says in Romans 9 and 10, and that is to, to confess that Jesus died for your sins and raised from the dead, that you would call upon his name, and the Bible says, whoever calls on his name will be saved. Would you be saved this morning? Would you know that your sins are forgiven? Would you have life? Would you have hope? Then I want to just lead you in a prayer right now. First, I'm gonna pray for those of us who do know the Lord that we would remember these things. And secondly, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer to receive the Lord if you need to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the resurrection of your son, Jesus. Lord, we praise you that you really physically, historically raised up from that grave. And the implications of that are mind-blowing and eternal and we could not possibly tackle them in this little time that we have. But Lord, for those of us who do believe, Christians, but maybe we've lost sight of it again. We don't want to just have good theology. We want to have reality. We want to walk in the truth of these things, that it would really guide the way we behave and live. Remind us, Lord, that our sins are forgiven, and may we have the joy of the Lord. Lord, may we live, and, and really by living, I mean letting your life live through us, Lord, that resurrection life now. And finally, Father, I praise you that we have the hope that someday we'll rise and be with you. But now I want to pray and lead in a prayer for anyone who wants to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I invite you to pray something like this. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. There's nothing in my strength that I can do to save myself. I cannot undo the sins I've done and I confess that I need a savior. I believe you died on the cross in my place. I believe you died and were buried and I believe you raised again on the third day. I believe that that resurrection proves who you are and I'm calling out to you now to be my savior. Please come into my life Forgive my sins. I put my trust in you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen, believer, let's live like we really believe this stuff. And if you just gave your life to Christ, if you prayed, I want you to know that the Spirit of God has come into you. In Jesus' words, you're born again. And I would invite you to tell somebody what you prayed today. Grab a Bible and begin to read, maybe in the book of John or the book of Mark. But I want to invite you into the family. And one of the first things we want to do is um, we're going to take a moment to uh, have communion. So we're going to just kind of pause things for a moment, give you the chance to gather some communion elements if you haven't done so, just some bread and some juice of some sort, and then we're going to come back and lead in communion. Finish off our service this morning. We want to end with uh, taking communion, and I hope that you're able to participate if you have a little piece of bread and some juice. Um, and it may seem strange at first, you know, why are we...